The comprehensive literature review by Kanchano Liriakal and Punkianit Shochuanit, hopefully I said those names right, provides a thorough analysis of the unique characteristics of East Asian hair, highlighting several key aspects. It discusses the genetic basis for hair straightness with a significant association identified between the EDAR37A gene variant and hair straightness in East Asians. In contrast, Europeans have a different genetic influence on their hair straightness, specifically the TCHH gene variant illustrating distinct genetic pathways in different ethnicities. The study delves into hair pigmentation focusing on the role of eumelanin and pheomelanin in determining hair color, particularly in East Asian hair. Eumelanin and pheomelanin, by the way, are two primary forms of melanin, the pigment responsible for the coloration of skin, hair, and nails in humans and other animals. And these types of melanin are produced in cells called melanocytes through a process known as melanogenesis. Now, the amount and type of melanin produced by an individual are determined largely by genetics, but environmental factors such as exposure to sunlight can influence melanin production. Anyway, going back to the literature review, it mentions that the melanocortin-1 receptor, or the MC1R, and its unique variants in Asian populations, especially the ARG-163 GLN variant prevalent in East and South Asians, potentially influences pheomelanin production. Now, regarding the melanosome size and density, which contribute to hair pigmentation, the review points out that East Asian hair shows different melanosome characteristics compared to African and Caucasian hair, contributing to its own unique coloration as well as texture. Additionally, the review goes on to note that East Asian hair exhibits the fastest growth rate compared to other ethnicities with African hair types having the slowest growth rate and Caucasian hair being somewhere in between. The study correlates these growth rates with hair structure, particularly the cuticle interscale distance, and observes that the cross-sectional area of hair seems to influence its growth speed. Now, in regards to androgenetic alopecia, Sensuanit and Lernioncal find that studies conducted on Asian populations have reported a lower prevalence of androgenetic alopecia in male and female versions compared to Europeans. Researchers find that the onset of androgenetic alopecia in Japanese men, for example, occurs approximately 10 years slower than Europeans, and the prevalence is about 1.4 times lower in each decade. This indicates a significant difference in the onset and progression of androgenetic alopecia between these ethnic groups. So this is just me theorizing and stepping in for a moment. It could mean that some groups probably have a larger window in their response time to treating androgenetic alopecia before it becomes too severe. But say if you were to control for that response time and just take comparable Norwood scales, maybe that would show that people still respond similarly. But again, it's that difference in the progression rate between different groups. So when looking at that alone, that could be an advantage for some Asian populations, but also, but also some Caucasian populations too. And this difference in the rate of miniaturization can possibly manifest itself in different patterns of hair loss. Because if you remember in another video that I made about the BASP classification system, which was conceptualized to be an improved version of the Norwood Hamilton scale, we can see that in some people, they have a slower and more gradiated miniaturization response rather than the basic response as seen in the Hamilton Norwood scale, where you just progressively move through each and every single Norwood level. But in the BASP classification system, it's kind of like you have a little bit of miniaturization here and then progressively gets it worse. But nevertheless, those hair follicles are still active and can respond to treatment. But we'll be looking at some studies later on in this video because it will sort of show that, yes, in some populations, they have a sort of gradiated miniaturization. And that means that miniaturization in some areas are worse than others, but nevertheless, there are still active hairs. But let's jump into a, another study. From another study titled, quote, Frequency, Severity, and Related Factors of Androgenetic Alopecia in Dermatology Outpatient Clinic, Hospital-Based Cross-Sectional Study in Turkey, unquote, 
found that the prevalence of androgenetic alopecia was reported to be 50% in Caucasian men and 19% in Caucasian women. Both prevalences were, were reported to be lower in Asian, East Asian, and Black or so-called Sub-Saharan African men than in Caucasian. And there are more studies that point out the difference between ethnic groups and the dynamics of their hair, or at least what it tends to be like. Again, we can look at another study, quote, Androgenetic Alopecia, Pathogenesis and Potential for Therapy by Justin A. Ellis and Rodney Sinclair, as well as Stephen B. Harp. And here, this study discusses the prevalence of androgenetic alopecia in white males and highlights about 30% are affected by the age of 30, increasing to 50% by the age of 50. It also notes that white males are significantly more likely to develop androgenetic alopecia compared to Asian and African men. Another study titled, quote, Characteristics of Androgenetic Alopecia in Asian by Wu Sun Li et al., unquote, indicates that androgenetic alopecia in Asian men, particularly in Japanese and Korean populations, has a later onset and lower prevalence compared to Europeans. Asian hair is characterized by its unique density and thickness, which are significant factors in the manifestation and treatment of androgenetic alopecia. So there are factors unique to Asian hair that make it dense in its own way, separate from other groups, if that makes sense. And this study was referenced in the Suchin Wanit and Larry Ockel Comprehensive Literature Review. So we can actually delve deeper here in this paper to see how different ethnic groups of the Asian population, how they tend to deal with androgenetic alopecia, its prevalence and its severity, and we can sort of make that comparison with Europeans. So when looking at Japanese men, androgenetic alopecia is less prevalent overall in the population, and typically, if it is to occur, it begins about a decade later than in European men. The incidence is notably lower in each decade of life when you're comparing these two groups. Now, the prevalence of androgenetic alopecia in Korean men is lower than in Europeans, and it also increases with age. So that's similar to both groups, by the way. So the prevalence for both European men and Asian men in general, as you age, right, you'll see more people going bald. But it's just that that frequency is less in this particular Asian population, Korean men, that is, and overall in Asian men. In Korean women, the prevalence also increases with age. However, they do have a lower prevalence of androgenetic alopecia compared to European women. Androgenetic alopecia prevalence in Chinese men is lower than European men, but also similar to Korean men. And in Chinese women, the prevalence is lower than in Korean and European women, but the difference might not be that great. Higher prevalence of androgenetic alopecia is observed in these regions, with Singapore showing up to 63% prevalence in older age groups, and Thailand's prevalence closely approaching that of Europeans. Now, Indian males show a less extensive balding pattern compared to other Asian populations, with type 2 being the most common until the 6th decade, or people's 60s, men in their 60s. When comparing men with European descent, studies showed a predominance of frontal baldness and varying androgenetic alopecia patterns increasing with age. Now, I want to take a bit of a quick sidestep. There was a recent 5-year long-term Dutash ride androgenetic alopecia study that was put out in South Korea. And what it observed was the differences between the basic hair loss pattern, so the classical Hamilton Norwood pattern, and the basic and specific hair loss patterns. Now, just to give a quick rundown, the basic hair loss pattern is typically you're just progressing through the Norwood states. It's just the miniaturization occurs at the frontal area of the hairline and also at the crown as well. Now, the basic and specific joined hair type, so the basic specific hair type, is like a combination of basic and specific variants. The specific variants examines that there is a bit of miniaturization here and there, but overall you tend to fit within this specific sort of Norwood, or I guess you can say basic Norwood classification, but with a bit of an additive, right? So let's say you're a Norwood 1, however, you have some slight thinning at the crown. Or you're a Norwood 2, but you're not fully a Norwood 2. You still have some sparse hair at the hairline area. Or maybe your vertex area as well is like thinning. Those are the BASP or the basic 
and specific hair type hair loss patterns. And what it found was that people who tended to have the specific types, so they tended to have miniaturized areas, but those areas still had active hair follicles, they responded better to dutastride treatment, such that they actually got more regrowth than people with the basic hair type. It didn't say that the basic people regressed and got worse. They just didn't see any significant areas of hair regrowth. So once again, I guess when it comes to looking at this quote unquote hyper responder, it's not that they're, it's not like the drug itself is, there's like some sort of sensitivity to finasteride and dutasteride that causes Asians to react better. It's just that their hair follicles are still somewhat active and there's a, a wider window so that the, this particular ethnic group can seek treatment compared to other groups. So they have more time to act on their hair loss than other groups do. But it looks like the differences, at least when I go through all these studies, this particular sort of genetic advantage is just so small that in reality, I think there's a better explanation. Again, I'll touch on that later on in the video. But to kind of just say that now, that explanation is mostly in the dynamics of the hair shaft that Asians have, the wide, thick hair shafts that sort of occupy more space and give a unique sort of density that when Asians do go back to their baseline antigen hair growth at comparable Norwood levels or BASP classification Norwood levels, they tend to have a much better aesthetic look than Caucasians and even other sub-ethnic groups in the Asian and Caucasian diaspora. But not to get ahead of myself, let's go back to looking at some other studies. This study titled, quote, Diversity in Human Hair Growth, Diameter, Color, and Shape by Genevieve Lozvorn and colleagues at L'Oreal Research and Innovation provides an insightful analysis into the diverse characteristics of human hair across various ethnic groups. Focusing on young adults from 24 different ethnic groups across five continents, the study utilized principal component analysis and hierarchical ascendant classification to examine hair growth parameters such as density, growth rate, and telogen percentage, as well as hair diameter and color. The results identified three major clusters representing classical hair types of African, Asian, and Caucasian ethnicities which were further differentiated into seven sub-clusters. Now, a key finding was that Caucasian scalps have about 30% more hair than African or Asian scalps. So that's interesting, indicating a significant difference in hair follicle density. Now, in contrast, Asian hair showed the fastest growth rate, potentially growing 5 centimeters longer than African hair in one year. Interestingly, these variations appear to be genetically influenced rather than environmentally as there are very few differences noted between the subjects of a given subgroup living in different locations. Although hair diameter was not measured in all subjects, the observed variation aligned with previous research, particularly highlighting differences in Asian hair. The study's comprehensive approach offers valuable insights for understanding ethnic variations in hair characteristics, which is crucial for fields like dermatology, trichology, and cosmetic product development ensuring tailored hair care solutions for diverse populations. 